Okay, let's talk about concurrency. Uh, well, uh, first of all, what does this mean? This means that uh, we have simultaneous threads of execution, one program that contains simultaneous threads of execution, so we can simultaneously do some work. And uh, the first question is, why do we need concurrency at all? And the answer is simple, like uh, if you have one worker digging, digging a trench, yes, it will do it slow. If we have two workers, then they, they will do it twice as fast. Three, three times as fast. It's, uh, so the more workers, the faster, the faster we go. At least at, to some limit, we will discuss it. So uh, in modern world, when we have multi-core CPUs, uh, we need concurrency. We need concurrency, uh, for example, when uh, we have a computational task which is heavy and which can be divided into subtasks. But not every algorithm can be subdivided to subtasks. There is a, uh, the whole area of uh, programming knowledge called uh, parallel programming. It's all about dividing, dividing tasks into subtasks. Uh, Another area of application of concurrency is uh, blocking and waiting. So when we asked a network for some response, we are waiting for this response for quite a long time. And we can uh, not waste this time, but do something, um, uh, uh, do something that we can just uh, do it right now. Uh, we need, sometimes we need to respond to request quickly. For example, user qu uh, clicked a button and of course they don't want to wait for, for, for a minute when everything's calculated. We need to give user a response and at the same time proceed with calculation in parallel. And of course, uh, maybe the most common usage is multi-user service. All the web sites that you are doing in Java, uh, mostly on Tomcat, for example, they are concurrent in a way that each user starts its own thread when it has uh, their request. You requested the page and this page is being prepared in a separate thread. If you have 100 users simultaneously asking for, for pages, the, all these pages will be prepared in separate threads. So we need concurrency. Uh, but we also must understand uh, the limitations when we not benefit from concurrency. Uh, for example, if task is CPU bound, if it's just uh, uh, heavy calculation tasks, it doesn't make sense to make more threads than there are CPU cores. Because just <laughs> uh, it's physical CPU core that does the calculation. Of course, so you can parallelize it, but you, you, you won't g uh, have any performance gain. Uh, the task is poorly parallelized, it's about algorithms. And we also limited by so, by things called uh, Amdahl's law and universal scalability law. These things that I want to show you first of all. Uh, remember workers who are digging digging the trench. There is always in all the work there is a part of the work that can be parallelized and the part that cannot be parallelized. For example, you have to I don't know to organize a bus and just uh, drive. Uh, and uh, to, to place workers well, on the place where, when they are going to dig. So this cannot be parallelized. This is just a constant amount of time. And uh, if we have, uh, for example, uh, a, a, maybe a tiny proportion of calculations that, cannot, that must be performed sequentially, that cannot be parallelized, then uh, just by very simple, by a very trivial method, we can see that uh, this proportion limits us, uh, limits the um, possible speed gain. For example, if the shared work is 80%, then you uh, cannot have more than a five-fold increase in uh, productivity by parallelizing. You can have <laughs> million workers, but if you need uh, one hour to get them all to just to construction site, it will be not less than one hour. Uh, and in fact, it's even worse because we, ha we also have another effect. Uh, for example, imagine these workers, they have to communicate with each other. They just have to communicate, they just have to agree, you, you go there, you go there, you 
do this part of work, you do this part of work. And uh, if we have N workers, the number of communications is like the number of edges in a full graph, and it's described by this formula. Maybe you are familiar with, with this one. So if we have like uh, how many people in this room and we want to, to make handshakes with, with each other, this is the number of uh, handshakes that will be made in this room. So, and you see this is a quadratic value. It's n squared here. So if we put this number, and uh, of course all these handshakes, they take some work. And if we put uh, this work to, to Amdahl's formula, we have this n squared in denominator. And this n squared in denominator actually makes things worse with the increasing of the number of workers. And this is called universal scalability law. And this is really universal law. This is applicable not only to calculations, it's also applicable to management. In management, uh, particular in management of uh, uh, creating a programs, it's called Brooks Law. And it says, uh, if your project is late, then adding more programmers <laughs> will uh, make it worse. It's not like just simply splitting the task. People have to communicate. So uh, we have some optimal values for optimal value for parallelization, and then you adding work power, but it just makes things worse. So this is uh, this is a universal thing. Okay. So, but now we are going to talk about concurrency, about splitting the task to subtasks and running running it in parallel. And this is a slippery slope uh, because uh, usually when we talk about concurrent and parallel programming, uh, we use Hydra as illustration. I, I hope you, you remember from Greek mythology, yeah, this creature, when you cut one head, there appears two, two more heads. So it's very, very difficult to conquer this creature. And uh, uh, yeah, Hydra is a real symbol of concurrency and multi-threading and uh, distributed systems and so on and so forth. So it's, uh, you, you will see it's extremely, uh, it's, uh, uh, extremely complicated. So you must consider, is it really necessary to solve your problem with concurrency? And how many threads do you need? Because it's not that simple. It's not that the more workers they have, the better. Okay, you have been warned. And let's start, let's start uh, exploring. Uh, okay, uh, first of all, uh, let me show you the very, very simple example, because Java was one of the first languages which uh, included concurrency into its standard library. Uh, so, uh, do I have this example here? Yeah. Uh, we have a class called thread in Java language. And this class uh, encapsulates uh, the notion of uh, concurrently running task. So we can uh, just extend this class and uh, override, uh, override run method. Here it just only uh, calculates a square, but uh, inside it might be some complex calculations. And here, how can we just uh, simply organize parallel execution? In fact, you never do it this way in real world, in real Java program. To the, uh, by the end of this lecture, you will see how to make it properly. This is just a simple example. In fact, you, you never write concurrent programs like this. But sometimes, in some outdated uh, tutorials, you might see this example. So you're creating two, uh, two threads, you start them, you join. Join means let's wait until uh, the thread ends, and then you you will see uh, how uh, you will see the result. Let's see the result. What's what's going to be a result? It's two squared and three squared. So let me run and see four and nine, like two squared and three squared. And congratulations, we just made the sim simplistic parallel program. So nothing very uh, very hard so far. Okay, uh, but <clears throat> we might have some problems. Let's consider another, another example. This is called dumb counter. Uh, see, this class has uh, this method. 
increment count, this value count, and it increments it uh, each time we call increment method. It's count plus plus. And uh, we have two, two options. First, uh, we are a uh, million times calling this dumb counter C1 increment C. Uh, the second example is different only in this parallel call. This parallel means that uh, we ask Java to parallelize the task. So it will split one million to sub, uh, sub ranges. So it will see how many cores do I have on my laptop and it will just split, it, split this task and it will uh, just, uh, just will call this for each in parallel. So what's going to be, uh, to be the result? First and second, your ideas. First one is just, we're just counting from zero to, five, uh, to one million. So it will be one million, obviously, right? What about this one? What do you think? We are doing, we're just counting, but we're counting, we, we just, uh, it's like we had one worker pressing this button million times. Now we have, I don't know, eight workers and they're just trying to press this button simultaneously. But anyways, there will be million clicks on this button. So let's, Let's run and see. You see, here we have one million, and here we have a value that's less than one million. And I hope you, you, you might guess what's happening here. Despite the fact that this one looks like an atomic uh, method, just increment value. In fact, under the hood, it's not atomic. It's like take value from memory, increment it, and put it back to memory. Imagine two, two threads came to, to the same point. They both take value, say, zero from memory. They incremented it to one. And then they both write one to memory. But there were two clicks. But we lost some of them. So here we have, uh, this is why we, this value is less than one million, because we lost some, some data. It's data loss. It's just so-called trace condition. So. Uh, at this point, you must, might understand that we need to synchronize them, like do something that to prevent data losses for the threads. But that's, uh, that's only the first example. Let's consider the next example. Uh, uh, let me show you, let me show you uh, this slide. See, we have two threads and uh, four variables. And the first one is going to, to do this simply. A equals one, X equals B. The second one is going to be B equals one, Y equals A. And uh, we are going to run these threads in parallel and see what's, the, what's going to be outcome. What is going to be the possible outcome? Well, it's not uh, really easy to, uh, just to think about watching this slide. So let me just uh, consider this step by step. Uh, what are possible, what are our possibilities? How do you think? These threads might be scheduled uh, one after another. Just uh, firstly we execute this code, then we execute this code. Then we are talking about concurrent execution. So we don't know, maybe this thread will be executed first and this one next. And maybe they will be executed con con concurrently like First, we're executing this one, then this one, then this one, then this one. Or like this, 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 and this. So all the possible uh, combinations, but what are possible outcomes? If we are executing first this, then we are assigning uh, A to one, X to B, that's zero, then B to one, and Y to A, that's one. So the outcome for X and Y, we're only interested in X and Y. Uh, final uh, final result is zero and one. If it's scheduled in such a way that thread two is executed first, then we have one zero as a result. So it's just uh, b equals to one, then y uh, is zero, then a equals to one, then x is one. So we have zero one 
here we have one uh, zero one here we have one zero we also can have just simultaneous sort of in simultaneous uh, execution like uh, a equals one b equals one and in fact it doesn't matter in uh, what order are we going to execute these two x b y a or y a x b it doesn't matter if we executed these two then the result will be one and one see but we don't see result zero zero here right so it seems logically it seems that we won't see any zero zero result let's check uh, as you can see now we have situation where execution is non-deterministic Usually, when you write code, you you uh, uh, you are writing deterministic code, like it's executed step by step, and you know the result. Uh, here, we don't have deterministic results, uh, so we need to execute code maybe millions of times, maybe in different Java machines to see to see all the possible outcomes. So this is what uh, what is made by a special system tool called JC Stress. So let me. Let me run this test because it takes some time. So uh, actually this is the, the same code and it's going to be executed many, many times and we'll see uh, all the possible outcomes and it will count the possible outcomes. And you see that uh, these three uh, results are acceptable and this is, this just don't have to happen, right? And see what we have here even although it's not finished. Oh, now it's finished. Actually, we have zero, zero result in 30% of cases. How come? How it's possible? What do you think? And this one, one result, uh, by the way, if all the possible interleaving uh, uh, have the same probability, you might think that one, one is quite probable result, right? But uh, you see in practice this one one result is quite rare. And this improbable result takes 30% of outcomes. So this just breaks your maybe uh, your model of execution, right? So how, ca how can this happen? Uh, but uh, let's consider another more simple result, more, more, more simple experiment. Uh, say we have... Uh, like automated way to fall asleep we're just uh while we're wa waiting to fall asleep we're counting some sheep and we are doing this in infinite loop like calculation and this is done in a separate thread and then from another thread here came a flag we are going to set this flag boolean asleep and as soon as this flag is set we're terminating our execution so uh, the, the question is, will we terminate this, this one? And again, I can run, uh, I can run a dedicated uh, test. So now, uh, now we have terminated state and stale state, so it never, never ends. And it will take some time to, to run. But in the end, you will see that in some cases, also we set this asleep flag. Another thread won't see this, uh, this flag. So let us wait. See, it's ended with, uh, with error. And uh, we have test failures because observed forbidden state stale test hung up so in some scenarios we will never exit this loop and this is quite interesting because uh, I'm pretty sure all that you studied earlier was about we have variables we can assign a value of to variable and then we're reading value of this variable and this is the same value but here in some cases because not always uh, do they have something about percentage? Like, 
you see, in 99% it will terminate, but in less than 1% it will hang, it, it hangs. So quite interesting, right? And the, the, worst, uh, the worst thing about this, that you might just write this code, just test it on your machine, push it to production, and in production you'll have high, high load, you will have maybe millions of requests, and some of them will, uh, will fail, and you never notice, you cannot even reproduce it on your machine. Because, as you can see, it just takes tiny, tiny fraction, less than 1%, but still, in some scenarios, you, you, you won't see this as sleep very far. So this, uh, this is just uh, examples of, of problems that you might come across in concurrent programming. The answer is that actually uh, here, uh, you, we will pretty soon you will see that it's because we don't have any synchronization. Without synchronization, it's not guaranteed that value that's set to some shared, uh, shared variable will be visible to another thread. So this thread just doesn't see this value. And uh, what's under the hood? Uh, just very, very approximate, very simplified picture. Uh, modern CPUs, they have multiple cores. This cores, each core has its own cache. And uh, there, will, there are different levels of caching, and then we have uh, this shared memory. If, for example, some, and, uh, some areas of the memory is uh, mapped to cache for, for, for whole thing to, to run faster. And, for example, if we are running this on one CPU and we are just setting this asleep to true, all we are doing is just modifying value in cache, not in memory. And when we are reading this sleep in another thread, it might be using might be using another cache, and it just doesn't see doesn't see the value. So it's that simple. Uh, nobody guarantees us that different that these caches are always synchronized with memory. Otherwise, it just doesn't make sense. We won't g have this performance gain that we have uh, for caches. Uh, the same here. The same here. Actually, we can consider this either as a reordering of execution because if we are just uh, uh, doing this in one thread, uh, this can be reordered and the result will be the same. So sometimes processor might reorder uh, operations just to speed up. But in this case, uh, we can uh, also explain it like, uh, we okay, we assign this shared value A to to one, but there is no guarantee that this thread will, will see this one in another thread. So, um, these are the difficulties that we must overcome uh, with uh, proper current code. Okay, so intermediate conclusions. <laughs> now, uh, I, I hope you, you, you saw the basic, the basic problems. Uh, due to reordering and other low-level features, it's impossible to reason about the execution the way you reasoned, uh, the, the way you used to reason about single-threaded programs. Like, here's the variable, we're assigning a value to it, and then we can read this value. No, you just cannot. It just need to use another model. Uh, all the problems are related to shared state. If we don't have shared state, if we have our first example, we have thread A and thread B. Thread A has its own variable, thread B has its own variable. We're calculating them in parallel, joint, and here are the results. If no shared state, no problems. And all the problems are non-deterministic. We need special tool called JC Stress and other tools to, to, to catch them, because it might work on your machine, but it won't work on production. And this is the, the, the most difficult part. It's not easy to debug. It's impossible to debug. Uh, and uh, at this point, you must understand that any problem with shared state without proper synchronization, what is synchronization, I will explain you very soon, is broken. Even if it, yesterday it worked on my machine. So <laughs> just uh, this argument doesn't work with concurrent programs. Doesn't work unfortunately. Okay, 
If there are two words that I want you to remember after my lecture, you can skip everything, you can forget everything, but uh, if you can just remember two words, then please remember these two words, memory model. This is the most important concept that you must understand. That there is such thing as memory model. It exists in Java language specification. It exists in many other languages that support uh, concurrency, but Java was pioneering. Java was the first language that uh, invented memory model, by the way. So, uh, Java memory model is a language and virtual machine specification that answers a, sim a simple question. If we assign this variable to some value, under what conditions will a thread reading the A variable will see the result of assignment? So, under some conditions, we are not guaranteed to, to see the result. Under some, con some other conditions, we are guaranteed. So we need to, to understand these conditions. Uh, this memory, memory model uh, introduces uh, the term called happens before ordering. What happens before? Happens before is a partial order. Uh, well, if you studied some mathematics, then you might know that there is such thing as order, uh, partial order, and linear order. Linear order is like uh, order uh, on, just the order they all used to, like order on numbers. Say we can always compare two numbers, just three and five. Five is, is greater than three. You cannot introduce two numbers that you cannot compare. To. Uh, but also there is a thing called partial order. Say, we can say that one set is greater than another set if uh, it's a superset, like it contains all the elements from another set. So just subset is a sort of order also because uh, it uh, has some properties like, like this one, like if A is subset of B and B is subset of C, then A is subset of C. It's called uh, transitivity. Uh, but we can imagine some intersected, intersecting subsets and for these subsets you just cannot say if it, one is greater or another because they're just different or they might not in, intersect at all. So uh, this is called partial order. So partial means that some pairs might be incomparable. So happens before is a partial order on execution steps. And uh, uh, Java memory model says that the action B to be guaranteed to see the result of action A if A happened before B in the sense that we are introducing here. So sometimes we can say that A happened before B and thus B is guaranteed to see the results of A. If it's not, then, sorry, we cannot guarantee anything. And we have a set, a limited set of memory model rules and uh, I, uh, my goal is to show you all of them and you will see that it's quite limited set and it's easy to, to memorize all the rules. And the first one is program order rule and it's a trivial one. If we have only one thread of execution, then each action happens before another action in the order of their definition in source code. This means that we are writing single threaded programs nothing strange will happen. It's like the way you used to program your <laughs> before. So it just uh, confirms that all the variables that you set in a single thread will be visible to, to the code that, that's defined later or executed later. We also have thread start and thread termination rule. And it says that uh, if we are starting a thread from another thread like thread A start from my first example. It happens before all, operation, all operations on the thread A. This means if I'm preparing some values, if I'm just preparing <coughs> arguments for thread A, and then I'm starting this thread A, uh, thread A will see all the work that I done before. I think this makes sense. And a Everything that thread A did must be visible to me as soon I, as I realize that thread A finished. 
either by calling join or by checking uh, thread A is alive equals false. So if we look at our first example here, uh, we're starting these threads, we're joining these threads. So these threads, uh, before start, they will see all the variables that we prepared for them. And after joining, we will see all the results, all the final results, all the work by, done by these threads. But as soon as they are executing, during the execution, it's not guaranteed for us at all. It's not guaranteed for us at all that we will see some intermediate results. Or if these results will be correct. So we just uh, cannot uh, even think about it. So we cannot reason about these results. It's just uh, undefined behavior. We just cannot uh, reason about these results. Okay. All right, they, they, these were first two rules uh, of uh, Java memory model. So far, so good, and you see nothing, nothing very, uh, nothing very tricky so far. We also have volatile keyword in Java. Uh, some of you ever met volatile keyword in source code? I think some, some of you did. Uh, so uh, you can declare a variable as volatile and as soon as you declare it as volatile then writing to volatile variable happens before reading from this variable on another thread. So uh, it, since it happens before then uh, it looks like this. When you're reading from a uh, variable uh, from volatile variable. Java compiler insert a special machine instruction called memory fence and this instruction invalidates caches. So actually it invalidates all the caches just to read one single variable. We need to guarantee that we will read the freshest value of this variable. So we need to invalidate the whole cache. And this automatically makes it visible all the other variables, volatile or not. And uh, so First of all, you must understand that this is uh, uh, performance-wise, this is uh, uh, just not very efficient. Like uh, we cannot, this is why we cannot just make all the variables volatile and enjoy the, their freshest values. It's just like we're uh, uh, taking our modern CPU and cut off the, all the cache. So it will be just, uh, it will just, uh, I don't know, ruin your performance. Uh, so this is why uh, not all the variables are volatile. Then uh, you might think, okay, let me just make one variable volatile and uh, uh, take advantage from, from this and read other variables. So my uh, suggestion is never do this. You're not allowed to do this because uh, relying on this will make your code extra fragile. If you just... Uh, uh, change the order of reading of variables, your program will be broken and you, it's very easy to change the order of reading. And uh, uh, so, and you will, will not notice this. So it's not, uh, so also you might know that such effect exists. You must not rely on this effect. And uh, wh when do we need volatile keyword? For example, in our first, uh, way to fall asleep. See, if we just make this variable volatile and run our test now, then everything should be fixed. It's running millions of tests, uh, actually. So my laptop is just <laughs> uh, blowing up. But let's see what's going to be the outcome. Come on. Oops. Ah, I forgot to, sorry, I forgot to recompile. I forgot to recompile. Uh, it's, 
Maven clean install, okay, and then I will run and we'll see. Uh, so yeah, sorry, uh, it's not compiling uh, compiling the code. And now dumb way to fall asleep. Okay, I will show you the outcome. But anyway, uh, the outcome will be good because uh, what we just did, we just uh, marked this asleep variable as volatile. And now we are guaranteed to, to get the freshest value of this variable each time we read it. Uh, like this. <clears throat> we also have uh, final fieldings in Java. I believe you remember what's final. Final means that as soon as you assign the value to final field, you cannot change it. And uh, uh, in Java memory model, it takes into account final fields. In, in a way that uh, uh, still you have to assign a uh, final field at some point, right? So when you're creating class, uh, Java uh, compiler will make you to assign value to each final variable. If, if you don't assign, then it won't compile. It will say you are not initializing some final variable. And uh, the place you are assigning it is, is constructor. And... Uh, mm, the fact is that as soon as you are not leaking uh, this reference from your constructor during the constructor execution and you are assigning these final fields, then these fields will be available to all threads without synchronization. So it's sort of a special memory fence for after constructor, for constructor. Uh, so the, the problem is that uh, sometimes when you are uh, writing the constructor of the object, let me show you. Oh, by the way, uh, fail test, no matches, error test, so uh, uh, see, it always terminated, unlike the previous one, without volatile. So one volatile keyword just fixed our problem. And uh, uh, sometimes, for example, we have constructor of the class, let it be maybe this one. And uh, you have some, uh, I don't know, consumer. Sometimes you do such thing like, uh, see here, we, uh, this, uh, this is just a reference to an object. But this object is not fully constructed at this point because we uh, didn't exit constructor yet. And this is unsafe. You might, uh, in single-threaded execution, during single-threaded execution, you, uh, you often do things like this because uh, for single-threaded it's just, okay, you edit this object partially constructed, doesn't matter, to some list, to some, you just registered it in constructor, from constructor. Uh, and uh, since it's uh, single threaded, you will work with this object anyways, only after this, uh, we exit this constructor. But when we have uh, multi-threaded execution, this is very dangerous behavior because uh, in multi-threaded scenario, uh, other threads might see this object partially constructed. For example, not all final fields assigned uh, to their values. So, uh, but, but if you are doing everything correctly, if you have, I don't know, final string some field and you are assigning this in, in your constructor and you never leak uh, references to this, Sorry, folks. There is a noise from 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 you. Sorry, you just uh, interfere. Uh, uh, if you just assign these variables and they are final, and you never leak uh, reference to this, it will be okay. So this fsss value uh, will be seen by other threads without any synchronization. So you should not bother about making volatile final or something like this. Okay. Let's let's move on. So uh, it's good. Uh, so everything, all the pro problems are related to mutable state.
to rephrase it, all the problems in concurrency is, are related to mutable states. So one of the possible outcomes is to make state immutable, never just mutated. Okay, now to more complex stuff. Oh, we have plenty of time, actually. Good. Uh, sometimes volatile cannot save us. Uh, for example, in this uh, dump counter, you might... Mm, oh, let me show it li right away. You might add uh, volatile to dump counter, like volatile int count, and run it. And as far as you understand, you can see now, it's still, it still, it doesn't help. It's still less than one million. Because it's still, uh, we have still the same problem. We are reading this value, we are incrementing it simultaneously, we are pushing it back, and we are losing some data. Uh, okay, it's volatile, we are reading <laughs> the freshest value, but still, uh, it, it, it won't help us, just reading the freshest value. <clears throat> oh, for example, we have just writing, imagine we are writing bank software, and we are just making this uh, method for money transfer. We have a uh, number of account from, account to, and we're transferring some amount of money. So we're just subtracting this amount from this account, and we just uh, adding some amount to this account, and uh, we just cannot do this simultaneously, because if we are doing, if we are calling this dump money transfer simultaneously, strange things will happen. We will lost some uh, some information, and uh, as as far as you can understand, this is catastrophic for bank, for example. <laughs> for bank, we always have to have this the same uh, the same amount on, of money on all the accounts. So it's going to be constant. Uh, okay, so we need something something more tricky, something more powerful when, than just volatile. And we have this, this is called synchronization. Uh, first, let's imagine how, how it works with, in real life in bank. For example, you have ATM and you have your bank card and you want to get some cash. You're just going to this ATM, insert your card and trying to get some cash. Imagine it's all being done in parallel. Two people came to ATM, they both just stuck to two cards to ATM. This won't work, right? So uh, this is like in old-fashioned banks, some, sometimes you have special booths with cashier, and uh, this booth has a door and it's locked. Like you're entering the door, you're entering this booth, you are locking the door under you, then you are communicating with cashier, please, please give me one million dollars in cash and uh, it serves you then another client comes up and they also want their one million dollar but they just turn the knob and it's locked they cannot enter the booth right so uh, they are waiting until the first process finishes this door is unlocked then second client can enter lock the door and ask uh, for service. So from the bank's perspective, you see two clients are served uh, sequentially, one after another. Uh, from client's perspective, they are parallel. They are just uh, uh, independent one from another. But here is this lock, and they are waiting on some lock. All right. Now, Let's, let me show some, some example on, in Java. We have special classes for everything. We have classes for threads and we have classes for locks. Uh, we have special class called reentrant lock and reentrant is so called because the same thread can enter many times. So if, if the code is, uh, uh, is in the same thread and this thread already acquired this lock then we won't lock ourselves. So it's Quite safe, and we can do this in such way. So we are creating this entrant block before executing. We are locking this bank lock, and see this bank lock is a shared state, sort of shared state. Then we are doing something, and then in finally block we are unlocking. 
Why are we doing this in finally block? Because some exception might happen here. If an exception ha happens here and we are exiting this money transfer without unlocking, then we lock the whole bank. <laughs> no services just uh, being made since then. So you see, uh, concurrent programming is a uh, very dangerous thing. You can spoil everything. If you forget about this finally block, if you just allow some, uh, somebody to jump out of this method without unlocking, then this, is, this will be disastrous. You will just block everyone. Uh, okay, all right. Yeah? Um, is this related to, like, when you do a transaction, mm -hmm. so there's the transaction fee. So, first it has to be that amount that you're sending, mm -hmm. and then it has to come and, and then from that balance it then has to come and deduct the fee. Mm -hmm. So, I guess it's related to that, that you cannot remove the amount transacted and the fee from the original balance. Uh, you have to deduct the amount that you transacted first, and then come and deduct the fee from that amount, from that balance. Uh, well, yes. the the key The key word here is transaction, right? So, in uh, there is a uh, this term is in banking is used in banking. This term is also used in database systems in uh, in programming, and this means transaction means atomic operation, something that that you just cannot split. If I'm transferring money, say, for you, a mm -hmm. uh, bank will charge me, and this all be just atomic. This transfer and their fee, it all comes together. You received money, I spent some money, I paid some fee, maybe you paid some fee, it all comes together in one piece. So it, it, if, uh, if something is broken in, in the middle, then it's just unchanged. This tra transaction is unsuccessful. It's not partially applied, it's just fully applied. Yeah. So, so which is deducted first, the amount or the fee? Oh, it doesn't matter in, in this example. I, I, in this example, it's just uh, like uh, transfer from account to account. The, uh, our goal is to, to keep uh, the amount on all the accounts constant. Like uh, we have bank and two accounts, for example, we have 100 hundred bucks on one account and zero on another account. When we transfer 50 from one to another, we have, in the end, we'll have 50 and 50, but uh, the sum should be 100. If it's not 100, then it's bad. Oh, by the way, um, I can run, uh, while, while explaining this to you, I can run uh, a test, like, uh, see, it's, uh, it's uh, the same the same code, dump money transfer, and we're expecting, uh, uh, we're expecting what? Uh, this, ah, this dump money transfer actually uh, returns the amount on two accounts. And originally it's zero, right? So uh, we have no money. And uh, in, in our scenario, we allow overdraft, for example, when I transfer from one to another, it will be minus 10 and uh, on one account, 10 on another account, but the total amount must be zero. It must be zero. Uh, so if we, uh, if we run, sorry, we run a non-terminal like dump money transfer, uh, let's see the possible outcomes, but while it's doing a test, uh, let me proceed with explanation. So, um, oh, I expected another question from you. Uh, see, we have first customer that's being served uh, by locking and unlocking. Then we have a second customer that's being served. Uh, you, you have to ask, and how it's guaranteed for the second customer to see the results of the work of the first customer. Because now you, you understand that by default, nothing, guaranteed to, nothing is guaranteed to us. By default. It's not just enough to, to think, oh, uh, the transaction is made, so another guy will, will see the results of transaction. No, it's not guaranteed, but the answer is that we have a special Java memory model rule for this. And this rule says that 
uh, when we are uh, exiting one, releasing one lock, the thread that's going to acquire the same lock is uh, uh, will see all the results of our work. So this is called uh, GMM monitor lock rule. And it says that unlocking happens before another locking of the same lock. It's that simple. Like unlocking happens before locking. But implications are quite complex. This, is actually, this actually guarantees us to see the results of previous execution. Only the same lock. If we are locking some other lock, we still not guaranteed to see the results. So, uh, this means that lock protected variables should no longer be declared as volatile because just it doesn't make sense. Anyway, memory fence will be executed, so anyway we will see the results. Is it finished? Oh, no matching tests. Why? Copy. Ah, that it's called dumb bank transfer. Sorry, dumb bank. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, while it executes this dump bank transfer, let me show you correct bank transfer, and it looks like this. So, as soon as we uh, make it this way, we will have no problems here. So this will, will solve our problem. Uh, right. In real life, banks not allow us to, to make payments if there are insufficient funds on our account. Right? So if I have 10 euros on my account, I cannot pay uh, 15, 15 euros. So uh, mm, let's think, think it this way. So we have just uh, uh, mm, payment instruction, say pay 50 euros as soon as there is uh, enough money on your account. So let us do it this way. Uh, so while there are insufficient funds, let's wait in a loop, for example. And then as soon as uh, there are sufficient funds, let's lock and make a transaction. What's wrong with this, with this code? What's the problem? What do you think? We are just waiting. And then as soon as there are sufficient funds, we will make a transaction. Make it correctly. Your ideas? Wake up. I'm going to ask more and more questions towards the end of, <laughs> of lecture. Yeah, we might finish. Uh, <laughs> yeah, waiting, waiting indefinitely because uh, this is not volatile. We we will not. We will might never see the actual result. Okay, make it volatile. Make it volatile. Okay, first, uh, first problem, yeah, we see. Uh, so make it volatile and now in each cycle we see the freshest value. So now, what's the problem now? So you said only when the amount is sufficient then you have the yeah, right. But it works like this. Uh, yeah, first, uh, first, yes, this is not uh, synchronized. This is not volatile. Okay, we made it volatile. So now we are reading the freshest amount and at some point we saw that, oh, uh, we have uh, s salary and now we have 100, 100 euros on amount. So we can pay 50. Cool. We are proceeding, we are taking a look, but someone in between might write off 80, 80 euros from my amount. And between this line and this line, it's not in the same lock. See, it's not synchronized, so it's just uh, everything might happen. We need to check. Okay. Uh, oh, by the way, let's, uh, let's see the results of execution. What do we have? 
see, we have, uh, in theory, we, we have to observe only zero and zero. And see, we, here we have zero and uh, two and zero, minus one and zero, all the possible combinations. Uh, so, yeah, it's uh, just strange. But as soon as we adding this lock and lock, it will, it will go fine. Okay, uh, but yeah, let's try to fix this one. Okay, the problem is that between this line and this line, anything might happen. So maybe we can try to do this, right? Lock, then wait, then transfer. What's wrong with this code? We locked, and we are waiting for for money to come. But we locked. We are supposed to unlock when uh, after the world. Yes, we need to unlock. Yeah, yeah, right. Because nobody will ever be able to to make yeah. transaction to our own account. Yeah, we blocked the bank. Yeah, <laughs> we cannot we cannot even deduct any small amount from the existing balance. You cannot even Support. get money from anyone because no transaction can be made because it's locked yeah we locked everything yeah it's foolish yeah because we just you entered the bank locked it and say i will wait for money but <laughs> the money cannot <laughs> cannot come because you locked the bank <laughs> nobody will ever be able to to put money on your account because you locked the bank okay so this one will not work also Uh, yeah, it's in finally. This means that uh, we are catching them here. Oh, we are not catching them. There might be errors. The uh, the main point is that we should always use try finally after locking, so that if any error occurs, the, we we unlock. So in case of any error, error we we must unlock, or else we will lock uh, the bank for in the indefinite time. But here here we have this stupid code that anyway will lock the bank for indefinite time uh, so uh, I think you see by now that concurrent programming is a dangerous thing it's very easy to make a mistake that will ruin everything and uh, so these won't work either so what should we do fortunately we have a special solution for this specific situation and this is called called condition objects what these condition objects do uh, uh, see, you have a, a lock, and for a lock, you can create one or more condition objects, and we call this condition sufficient funds. So that's uh, that's the conditions that we are going to wait on. And uh, how we're we going to 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 do now? What we are going to do now? We entered the bank, we locked it. So we see as soon as we locked it, we see the freshest uh, the freshest values everywhere. Java monitor uh, lock rule, Java memory monitor lock, uh, uh, rule. Uh, okay, we see the freshest value, and uh, in this while, if there are sufficient funds, then we proceed to transaction. If funds are insufficient, then we are going to wait on this sufficient funds uh, object. We, we call it a wait. What happens then? As soon as we call the wait, we're unlocking the bank. So, uh, from the perspective of our thread, we're just sleeping. Our thread is sleeping. But it's, it, it sleeps, but uh, it unlocks the bank so that other threads might enter here, make lock, make transaction. For example, uh, put some money on your account. They're putting some value on your account. And then, see this sufficient funds signal all this signal all uh, things just signals other threads that okay something happened please wake up and check if it's okay or not and then you just uh, exit exit the transaction but as soon as you signaled uh, all the objects this await will wake up but it wakes up and together with waking up it 
uh, holds the lock. It acquires the lock. So uh, waking up is not just about it received the signal and wakes up. It wakes up and tries to acquire the lock. And it won't wake up until it acquires the lock, actually. So that when we are going to another cycle in this while, we are still in this lock section. So we are still locked in this bank. So we are still, uh, still what? We saw the freshest values because we acquired the same lock, right? So we are guaranteed to see the freshest values. And we are guaranteed to, to be here alone in this bank. So we can check for amount. And if it's sufficient, then we can proceed with transaction. If it's still insufficient, we will wait uh, again. But while waiting, we will give other threads possibility to acquire the same law. This is how it works. So condition object for wait is very complex, right? So when we are going to this wait, from our perspective, it's like we're just sleeping. We're just pausing execution and sleeping, and we will uh, sometimes this wait will return and we will be able to, to move on to another while cycle. Inside, this wait is very complex. Uh, as soon as we called it, we release the lock so others can do something. And when we are signaled here, we are trying to acquire the lock and do the same. For example, uh, imagine that there are many, many money transfers and they are all waiting on the same condition and then signal came it's not that all the money transfers are going to to be made simultaneously no because they will be made sequentially they will just uh, align in a queue and they will be executed one after another so i hope you have this picture in your in your head now uh, so let me reiterate this is this is very, very important stuff, and this stuff is uh, very often asked on job interviews, on Java job interviews. I will explain you why. <laughs> so, wait releases the log, signal all signals to all waiting threads, exiting a wait acquires the log again, and when exiting a wait, we must check the condition uh, first because uh, in this scenario uh, there might come some some money but this is an insufficient fund so we we need to check it again but you might think okay uh in some for some algorithms it's just enough that something happens uh no matter what no matter what amount but if something happens then we can proceed so uh you'd be tempted not to use this while cycle here but uh java specification says mm. that there are spontaneous there might exist spontaneous wake-ups so without any signal, you might exit this wait without any signal. So Java doesn't guarantee it, uh, guarantees it uh, because also because of some performance issues and so on and so forth. So you just have to use this wait in while loop each time in each uh, algorithm in each program. A wait must be in a while loop. Strange, right? And uh, and Java language just doesn't uh, doesn't help it uh, help you with this. If you push wait outside of while loop, it will compile, it will run, but uh, it will be sort of a problem with your program and a problem that's very difficult to uh, to figure out because spontaneous wake up might never occur on your machine, but it will occur sometime in production. <coughs> Oh, by the way, it's an interesting question. Never thought about it. <laughs> Have to ask uh, Shipilov maybe because uh, uh, it's interesting. Yeah, let me let me check. I I think yes. If we manage to write uh, to write uh, uh, the test that uh, detects it, uh, I think yes because it's uh, it's really about like uh, running it millions of times under all the possible circumstances. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, and uh, of course, I already explained it to you, but it's good if you ask yourself this question, uh, how are we guaranteed that we will see freshest value here? We are guaranteed because after exiting a wait, we, uh, we acquired the same lock. 
and only because of this. So, please, starting from from today, please uh, please try to reason about code execution in terms of Java memory model. Uh, all right. Uh, I already saw it, uh, told it to you. So it's just uh, just a correct condition waiting pattern. Uh, by the way, this is uh, uh, this is not the shortest code that can can be used to achieve the same behavior because uh, starting from Java version one, uh, there was a notion such thing as intrinsic locks, intrinsic locks, and intri intrinsic synchronizations. Uh, Java language designers made this because they wanted. Uh, Java to support concurrency better, just uh, for you to, to, to write shorter concurrent code. And uh, this is why, how it can be made another way. We're just using this word synchronized. What does synchronized mean? Synchronized means that uh, before entering synchronized method or synchronized section, we are acquiring an intrinsic lock on some object, in this case on this object, on, uh, on the instance of, of the class itself. So actually each and every object in Java can be used as lock. This is how Java is made. Maybe it's not the best decision, but it's uh, like sometimes it uh, helps us to write just more concise code. So in this scenario, it's like, uh, it's like having uh, this uh, uh, this dot lock try finally uh, this dot release lock so we're just using this synchronized and it does does it for for us so we just uh, uh, this means that no two threads will enter this method simultaneously for for the same instance of uh, of the class Uh, they will queue. Uh, uh, they will queue automatically under the hood. So you just calling you, in, in your code. You just uh, call money transfer and another thread. You call money transfer, but uh, these are synchronized uh, via lock or via intrinsic lock. No matter how, you are not writing this queue. You are just calling it, but inside under the hood, well, will be a queue that will work for you. So it's uh, yeah, it's very powerful, powerful thing. So. Um, mm, uh, there is another, yeah, another, th another form of synchronized block, and this this one is actually better. Uh, we can put synchronized keyword not on on uh, method level, but inside some uh, block code block, and we are uh, just passing explicitly passing some lock here. See how it works. We created a new object. It can be a string, it can be anything, everything in Java, any object can work as lock. <laughs> and uh, you created this object and you are using, and this field is private. See, it's not visible to, to someone else. And this means that this lock cannot be used by anyone besides methods in your own class to be used as lock. Unlike in this scenario, in this scenario you still have outer class that can be used as lock in some synchronized section. Some crazy programmer might might use it, and if they use it, they will spoil your uh, performance. So uh, uh, this is this is how uh, this is why we we utilize uh, encapsulations in Java, like we are hiding our internal state into private fields, so that others won't be able to use it. Because we're telling, these are our, our own fields, we might change it in the future, so please don't use it in your work. Uh, we also can uh, encapsulate locking, encapsulate locks, and uh, this is a good practice, actually. So uh, uh, please uh, prefer doing it this way, create an object explicitly and use synchronized lock here. So this is a better practice. It will do the same. So no, no two threads will simultaneously enter this, uh, this section. 
they will wait up, they will queue up and wait uh, on this lock. And uh, this will work. So, uh, uh, ah, sorry. We also have one uh, intrinsic condition object on each of the objects uh, in Java. So, uh, like this. Uh, see, we have uh, this log, and we we also call this log dot wait, and we also call this log dot notify all here. So actually, this is less code than in this uh, than in this example, right? So we have bank log, also log, uh, also wait and uh, signal all, but here we have this try finally. In this uh, in this example we have what uh, we have this synchronized but we are calling lock wait and we are calling lock notify also this is uh, uh, we're just not creating a separate object right we're not creating some conditional object here and uh, what does this mean this means that each object in java also has intrinsic uh, condition object but only one only one for entrant lock for example you can create as many conditional objects as you like when you are using intrinsic objects, then you have only one condition, but this will do in 99% of the time. So uh, you are calling this wait, you are calling this notifier all, and otherwise it works just like previous example. I have GC stress examples, but I won't run them because they are not that interesting, because uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this scenario, everything will just work smoothly. So uh, for intrinsic conditions, this is also the thing that that is often asked on job interviews because uh, job interviewers they uh, often like to ask something: What methods are there on object class in Java? And you are starting to to memorize: mm, We have to string, we have hash code, we have equals, and then this wait notify and they, they wait wait what's wait is for let me explain and so on so forth so this is often asked uh, uh, you must memorize just this pattern that I explained it to you so uh, you must always follow the strict pattern synchronization while loop wait it's very important because of spontaneous wake ups notification and uh, you must understand that you always should synchronize on the same uh, object, wait on the same object, and notify this object. It must be the same object. Many uh, novices, they make the mistake, they synchronize on one object and they, they try to wait on another object. It just doesn't make sense. You cannot... Uh, calling wait uh, on an object on which you uh, didn't acquire the lock just won't work. The, the bad thing is that all these things compile and run, they just don't work normally. Uh, in general, this is a low level mechanism that you won't be, most probably you won't be ever using in your real life projects. I will, in the second part of my lecture, I will show you the, the real life scenarios, the real life uh, concurrent program, programming in Java. Mostly this is required for job interviews. But why people asking this on job interviews? They just want, that, want to check that you learned at some good place. Uh, because unlike... Mm, uh, you can just use tutorials or you can just use manuals and learn basic programming stuff. Like for cycles, while cycles and things like this. Unfortunately, concurrency is not something that you can learn yourself without, without any help. Maybe you, somebody at least must suggest you some books maybe on, on this stuff. And it's very easy to, to write, oh, I have this thread object, let me start a thread, let me stop the thread, or oh, I am doing concurrently programming, or uh, concurrent programming. Or you just think you are doing concurrent programming, <laughs> you are doing it uh, wrong. Okay, by now, and uh, I think uh, very soon we are ready to, to make a break. By now, we understand the meaning of all the possible thread states in Java. So in Java, uh, we are creating a new thread. 
and then we start this thread and then it's in runnable state. Runnable means that it's either run or not being run. We just don't know because we cannot see these intermediate results. They are not guaranteed by a Java memory model. So it's runnable. But it's the same as running. Uh, then we are trying to acquire a log. And if this log is occupied by some other thread, then we are in blocked state. When lock is acquired, then from block state, we are in runnable state, but we are guaranteed to see the results of the work of the previous guy who occupied this lock. We also uh, can be in waiting state. Waiting state is not like blocked. See, it's a, a separate state because uh, we entered the lock, then we are waiting for notification. In waiting state, we unlocked the lock. And uh, uh, as soon as notification, uh, uh, but we're still not doing doing anything. Uh, as soon as notification came, we're uh, also in runnable state. There is a separate thing called time waiting. Uh, we also can call time with some arguments uh, telling that please wait for condition for maybe 10 seconds. After all, after these te 10 seconds, please wake up. This is also possible. And by the way, we all uh, know about this thread dot sleep method in Java just uh, pause the it just pauses the execution for for a couple of seconds sometimes we are using this thread sleep when we are calling thread sleep we are actually in timed waiting so we we are not waiting for any actual signal but we want to wake up after two seconds so it's uh, the separate uh, separate state and when uh, th thread finishes then it's in terminated state and the thread that's that is in terminated uh, state cannot be reused, by the way. We need to create a new thread if we want to run it again. I will talk about it uh, uh, in the second part of the lecture. So sometimes it uh, doesn't make sense. We, we want to always utilize or reuse the, the same thread and never allow it to, to be terminated. Uh, okay, intermediate conclusions and then we'll have a short break. Uh, so, where possible, use immutable state. All the problems in concurrent programming is because of immutable state. You might think that you are not doing concurrent programming just now. But in fact, you do. If you're writing some uh, website, web application for Tomcat, each uh, request is being processed in a separate thread. So, actually, you do. Uh, so, immutable state is automatically thread safe, so create as many immutable classes as you can. It's just a generally good practice, good advice. If you need access to immutable state, use volatile, but volatile is quite, has quite very limited usefulness in a limited number of situations where synchronization doesn't matter, but you just want the freshest value. Like in fall asleep uh, uh, example. Uh, hold the lock while performing operation that should be atomic. So there are no such thing as atomic operations in Java, even plus plus operation. It looks like atomic, but it's not at all atomic. Uh, if you need, uh, oh, by the way, how do we fix, how do we fix uh, our first example about dump counter? Let us th fix it and see that it works. Uh, how do we fix it now? Volatile, uh, remember this one, right? Volatile didn't help us. How do you fix it now? Synchronized? Where should I put synchronized? Here, right? So now no two threads can call this simultaneously, right? So let's, let's run and see what's going to happen. One million, one million. Hooray, we fixed. <laughs> and another, just another, another example, just uh, let it be object, uh, lock, a new object. And uh, uh, the, better, the better way to do this uh, is like this. Uh, synchronized lock and this. And let's run and see if it's going to work. It must. It also works, but why it's better? Why it's better? Because, uh, mm, yeah, uh, if we put it this way, 
if we put it this way, actually it's equivalent, it's just uh, syntactic sugar for, for this. See, you are using this as an intrinsic log. But if you are using this as an intrinsic log, nobody prohibits someone to use the same class, the same instance as an intrinsic log for some other reason. And this just doesn't make sense because you might, uh, uh, you don't want to exclude uh, like uh, simultaneous call calling on increment and some other, some other method. But if you are using the same, the same uh, object as intrinsic log, they, all these calls to this method will queue up and this will just break the performance. So this is why uh, using private private logs is is a better practice. Please please remember this. Uh, okay, think about thread safety all the time and uh, understand what is Java memory model. So I think at this stage we can have a 15 minutes break. Let's uh, meet uh, 15 minutes uh, to 12 and proceed with uh, with Java concurrency. <laughs>